and uh, so I am here on ACMI Gather Radio as well as Ustream, streaming live, and um, just thrilled to be here. You know, I have so many ways um, for you guys, to, I shouldn't say it like that because I'm still trying to work on more ways um, for you guys to see me as I do this and for you to listen to me. Um, if you're listening to me, ACMI Gather Radio dot org and uh, you can go right there and listen just by clicking on and, and if you're listening I'm assuming you're either using PowTalk or the tuner that's there. You can also see me streaming live on Ustream TV and that is Ustream dot TV forward slash Sandra said it or you can go to the fan page that I have set up on Facebook which is facebook.com forward slash Sandra Thrives. So that's S A N D R A T H R I V E S. And when you get there, there's a little link that says Sandra Unplugged. And you can watch me on Ustream there, right there on the page. Or you can just go to Ustream. And on Ustream, there is an actual chat window as well as here on Paltalk. So you can either chat with me on Ustream or here on PowTalk. And I'm so glad you guys are all here. Uh, what a blessing this is to be able to do this show every week and um, to participate and share with you. And even to listen throughout the week to other teachers as they talk about A Course in Miracles. Um, you guys, I want to make sure that I am also... Uh, letting you know that I am revamping SandraSetit.com and SandraSetit.com will have all these links on there as well as soon as I get those things up and running. I want to show, do this show um, much like I usually do by starting it off sharing with you the introduction to A Course in Miracles. The intro introduction in The Course in Miracles is right there behind the table of contents it's a paragraph, and I just so love the paragraph. It says, this is a course in miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The aim of the course is not to teach the meaning of love, but that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to your awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened, and nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Isn't that fabulous? You know, um, I, I have constantly people telling me that they have either listened or watched the show who know nothing about The Course in Miracles. And it's interesting because as I talk about The Course in Miracles, um, I talk a lot about that very paragraph, the introduction to A Course in Miracles. And it says it can be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists. Well, it goes along with what we always say. You're a spiritual being having a human experience. What is real is eternal, and it will not change. It was existing back from the beginning and will exist eternally, that in infinity or, or, or forevermore, it will exist. So what is real about you is your spirit. What is real about you is this consciousness that is you. What's not real is that physical body that you carry around with you. And so when you think about nothing real can be threatened, who you are, the essence of who you are, the love that you are, the consciousness that you are, all that you are, that will remain on forevermore. And that is a special thing, a wonderful thing to know. Um, it's interesting because um, this past week I have, Oh, goodness, I can't even tell you how much stuff I have um, encountered. Last week, as I was doing the show, 
um, bless his heart, somebody typed into the window asking a question, asking me if I would talk about idols and idolatry. And it was so interesting because, um, you know, when I talked about it, I get really excited. That was a, a topic that I used to address from time to time. And it was something that I used to get really excited about because I had had so much experience with the, the nature of idols and idolatry and putting our energy into something else. So, um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about that. But, but, but as you know, for those of you who have been listening to me for any time, I like to be very personal, upfront and personable with you about the things that I've encountered in my life. And, um, and, and it seems as though, I don't know why, I don't know why, but it seems as though I have such a rich experience to pull from. I mean, it seems like everything that could have happened to me has happened to me. And I feel blessed because of it. Nothing, I don't have any bad comments or any, any bad stuff to say about my life. I feel extraordinarily blessed because of my life. But um, I remember years ago, I was sitting in a, um, a library, and at the time I was publishing a newsletter. I am always, I have always, it seems like, been in the media some way or another. So even before I started doing radio, I had a little newsletter that I used to put out. And um, I'm in this library because I didn't have a computer at home, didn't have internet. I don't even know if internet was big back then, but um, I was I was sitting in this internet, I mean, in the library, and I'm typing up this newsletter, and so there's this woman, as always, that wants to witness to me, and, and that's what we call it, that's what, um, you know, Christians call it, um, they call it witnessing, you know, I've got to go up and I've got to tell her about something, you know, in my life or in her life that she felt was just so extraordinarily important. And so as she's sitting there and she's witnessing to me, she says to me that um, when you give a man your body, you give him all that you have of you that's valuable. And and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like, really? <laughs> you know, um, really? <laughs> that's what I kept thinking when she said it. And, um, you know, I think I got a little, not saying that I got irritated with her, but as I dealt with and struggled with the topic that she had brought up, and I don't know why, I don't know what else she said before that or what she said after that. All I know was, is that at that present time, I was stuck right there where she said that. And so as I sat there and I dealt with it, I was thinking to myself like, okay, now because I am a survivor of rape, I was like thinking to myself, like, well, are you trying to say that what was valuable, everything that was valuable of me was already taken from me? I mean, was she serious? And so I kept thinking to myself, I have got to be more than just a body. I mean, this cannot be all there is to me. And I must have something else to offer somebody other than just this body, because even before I had heard about the Courts of Miracles, I knew that this couldn't be it. And so it led me down a path of, of really um, trying to wrestle with this idea about who I am and where my value is and what it is that other people see, like, love, enjoy about me that is beyond this body. And unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, we, and I, and I don't know that this is true, but it seems like the evidence suggests that a many, great many people walk around as if that is all they are. I mean, we spend countless dollars, um, not only getting our hair done, our nails done, um, you know, doing our muscles and, and, and trying to get ourselves into a shape or, you know, or trying to make ourselves presentable because somehow somebody has told us that as we are, even as we are, we're still not quite good enough. We look at each other and we measure each other and one another's worth based on something as, you know, something like a body. I mean, so I'm saying that, yes, I'm saying that. And, and so it became this 
wild pursuit that I had to really understand who I was outside of the physicality of my being. And so as I set out to do that, I started thinking about all the things that we imbue with power as if it is who we are, as if it is something that um, tells the world, you know, our worth. So I see so many people, I mean, we do this all the time, so many people that think that they can add value to themselves by obtaining stuff. You know, it's amazing how often we do that. We obtain stuff as if it really adds something to our total worth. So, you know, we go out and we get the fancy cars and we get the clothes and we get the watches and, you know, and, and the hair and all of these different things. And, and really, you know, it, it, I, I have to ask myself all the time, what is this about? Who is it that told us that our worth was not established by God? Who is it that told us that it was something different? So in the Course, Jesus said that if this was the message that I was meant to bring you, what I have, like, what he have gone through all that he did in order for us to know the truth about ourselves? He said that this crucifixion is the last useless journey that you must take. He was trying to tell us that this body is nothing. I can lay it down and I can still communicate with you. I mean, he still communicates with us all the time through, the, you know, through the Holy Spirit, however you want to say it, but communicating all the time. So communication is so much, it's so far beyond the body and so far beyond what we do. And so it becomes this thing of us trying to find this, you know, this going, turning back on ourselves and getting really within ourselves to find out who we truly are. Um, okay, so uh, London, UK, Buddhists are good on detachment. Yes, they they surely are. You know, um, one of the, the things that I loved was I heard that um, the quote that said, if you meet Buddha on the road, kill him. And, and then it was explained to me that if you see Buddha outside of yourself, then you have misidentified really where Buddha is. You've misidentified where God is. If you see God outside of yourself, I'd say kill him, you know, because God is within you. That is the very essence and source of your being. When I bought my new car, I cried when I got, when it got stretched the first week after two months, I could not care less, laugh, <laughs> laugh. Well, you know what, and, and I, I've been the same way with possessions and items, but we find out that those things, that that the value is not in the things. The value is in who we are and in our personhood. So, you know, I was, I was, as I was going through this, I was like thinking about all the ways that we externalize our own power, our own worth. So whether it is looking at it like how many degrees do I have? How intelligent am I? What kind of title do I have? How much do I get paid? I mean, we, we, we have so many things that allow us to externalize our source of power, to put it out someplace else, rather than recognizing that as we are, we are just whole, perfect, and complete beings. It said that, um, I think I read the quote last week where it was talking about, um, that God said created man and said it was good. And then the Course said, no, it was perfect. And, and, and perfection is this idea of completeness. I mean, it is like when something is complete, totally as it should be, it is perfect. And so, you know, um, and so what if, if we have flaws? It is our flaws that add to the beauty of who we are. I mean, so many of us want to be, I, I don't know, it, maybe it's this, this idea that, um, that we project onto others, this idea of how they should be, what they should be, all this other stuff. And so if we get caught up in that idea, then we're sort of judging ourselves and, you know, like competing on something that is, I mean, just, just crazy. How often do we compete? I mean, even here, you can listen to, um, you can listen to different speakers and, 
and different radio shows. And it almost as if it's almost as if sometimes you hear this competition going on, even between people who know better. It is. It, it seems as though we have, you know, caught or or, or 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 put some type of value on this thing, this competition thing. And and I, you know, I, sometimes I really don't get it because I'm thinking to myself, you know, like if com- competition in itself seems to me to be demeaning. I mean. If I'm competing with somebody, it's already saying that, you know, that that I'm not walking my path. I'm not doing Sandra. I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to fit into something else that is other than my natural self. And so if I'm really being my natural self and being true to myself, then then what Sandra does doesn't necessarily look like what somebody else does. I don't get out on the dance floor and try to do the same dance and mimic everybody else. It's like because I feel it the way I feel it. So I do it the way I do it, you know, without trying to, you know, without trying to make it seem like it it needs to be somebody else. But, you know, I, I think that that's something that we've learned over the years, that we're not quite good enough as we are. And if we start to, you know, I I talked a little bit last week about um, that mirror exercise that I used to do about looking at myself in the mirror and and starting to talk to myself. And when I really looked myself in the eye and talked to myself, it was amazing the transformation that I made in how I saw myself and in how I saw the world. And and it was it was interesting because there was something that was looking back at me. Not just not just this, you know, we have a tendency to look at things and not see them. You know, we look at them and we don't see them. But to really look at yourself and to feel yourself looking back at yourself is a very powerful thing. You know what, um, actually I felt um, that I needed to open up a book here. And so let me open up a book right quick. Um, I'm going to read London UK's comment. Um, is it perception? It is perception that makes projection or the other way around. And, and it seems like it's a circular argument, doesn't it? Um, perception, all of that stuff. So um, this past week, I was reading out of this wonderful book that was sent to me. Um, it is The Holy Spirit's Interpretation of the New Testament. And Regina Dawn Akers and Dove made sure that I had a copy of this. And um, I was reading in here, and um, it was so interesting because I, I read this chapter, Luke chapter 2. And I want to share something with you out of here just because I felt moved to. Um, It says, the birth of Jesus represents the birth of willingness. Humble at first, but promising within it all the glory of heaven. Mary pondered this promise in her heart, not with the worrisome thoughts of the ego, but with her heart where the Holy Spirit is. This is what I ask of you. Willingness has been born in the mind. This willingness promises all the glory of heaven, but this willingness is the Savior, the Christ, and it is with you within your heart. Do not worry how this willingness will grow to become the glory it promises to be. Rest instead with the thought of the promise and be grateful. It is through your love and gratitude that this baby is nursed. Its growth is inevitable, so do not worry about it. Love it with your heart and be happy there. So um, as I pondered this idea of willingness, oh, you guys, it just is so much for me. Um, so so on this, the same line of, of, of thought, right after I did the show last week, um, I'm on going to the outdoor concert that I told you guys or mentioned last week. I'm going to this concert, and a guy comes up to me who I have met before, 
he is a friend of another guy who is just, I'll say that's kind of obsessed with me. This guy, uh, he likes me. And so he decides he's going to walk up to me um, before I get to the place. And the guy says to me, he was like, you know, um, my friend, our mutual friend, the guy who has a crush on me, he says to me, he was like, well, you know, he has a lot of money. And I, you know, and I, I, I kind of looked and I thought, like, and so, you know, like I've, I've dated guys with lots of money before. When, since when does money impress me? I was like, you know, so, <laughs> you know, and so then he decided he was going to throw in some other comment, you know, about, um, <laughs> about this guy's uh, sexual performance, about how great he was. And I was thinking, you know, and I said to him, either one of those two in a personality might be wonderful, but in and of itself, neither of those two are really, like, impressive. So I was just really not interested still. But it was so interesting because I thought to myself, and, and, and here's the other question I asked him. I said, well, wait a minute, how do you know how he is sexually? And he says, well, you know what, he says, that was the story we made up that we were going to tell you. And I thought, wow, really? <laughs> you know, so um, so I thought, you know, he sends out his representative, you know, instead of coming himself or instead of saying these things to me, he sends out his representative to sort of add weight or value to who he thinks he is and then wants me to um, somehow agree with his assessment or his idea. So often we think that people have the same values that we have. And so what we do is, is we put out things out there because, because the collective consciousness says to us that what's valuable in our society is, is that you, um, be a great lover or that you have a fancy car or that you have a lot of money or this or, or that or whatever. It is. People in, in, in our society have put such a strong emphasis on those types of things that it never dawns on them that what really somebody might be looking for is somebody that they would want to talk to for the rest of their lives. I mean, some personality, for God's sake. And, and, and so we sort of miss the mark about what's really valuable. We think it's out there when really it's in within us. And if we work just as hard about developing our spiritual selves, that, that part of us that, that is interesting, that part of us that, that sees the world through our eyes like only we can, if we put as much emphasis on that as we did on that other stuff, I mean, we come with a total package. But as it is, we come up with this idea, you know, uh, our crippled selves, this, 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 this representative that's not even whole. It's as if somehow something or somebody has taken the feet or the legs from under us and told us, now you walk on these false crutches or these false legs so that you'll look a little taller in the world, you know, so that people will think you're more than you are. How can you be more than you are when you are all, when you are part of this allness that is God? I love this stuff. So after I read out of that, um, that, uh, the NTI, the, in, the interpretation of the New Testament, I wrote this down. Yeah, you know, whatever. I wrote it down. I said, you know, I said, you know, we're playing a role, a role, a role. We're playing a role when we're not being totally, you know, who we are. But even on this level, remember nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists. As we take on bodies, we are playing a role for one another. You're asked to personify God. You keep dilly-dallying around and getting caught up in the games and trivial pursuits rather than knowing that the journey is a symbolic one where you demonstrate parts of your God self. Jesus' journey is all of our journeys, pointing us inward to ourselves. All that is asked is that we be willing to play our parts. The script will be given, and being given, it will be holy, and it cannot be lost or diminished. It cannot get lost. You cannot get lost or off track. 
as long as you are willing. And I say yes, I say yes to playing my part. I am willing to do my part to personify God on this level. You know, I um, it's interesting. I, I constantly have people that come up to me and they say to me, Sandra, you're always smiling and you're always happy. And, and, and it's so true because I, my happiness is never determined by my circumstances. So literally, my world can be falling down around me and you'll still see me smiling and still see me happy because I see everywhere I look, I see God. Everywhere I look, I see this, you know, as if it is something here that is, you know, that is asking me just to be willing to let this spirit flow through me. And as I'm willing to let spirit flow through me, it's like I, you know, I have no choice but to smile and to be happy. I mean, there is, I mean, y'all know how wonderful this is? Do you know how wonderful all of this stuff is? So, I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine why somebody would be upset or, 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 or confused. Because here's the thing. We're also told that this is a required course. So you are living your life. You are living a coursework in God's school understanding that you are personifying this spirit, God, Jesus, however you want to say it, you are walking the journey, that particular journey. It is the one that you're doing in your name. So whatever your name is, you're walking it as you, but that's still the same lessons, the same trials and tribulations you are expected to carry out. But the thing is, is that we get caught on the lower rungs of experience. We get caught in the little bitty stuff because we're so busy trying to, trying to in spirit or inspire or put our spirit into other stuff that we can't really recognize and develop the spirit that is within self, that is self. So if I'm constantly trying to, you know, put a little piece of Sandra over here in a car and a little piece of Sandra over here and what you think about um, my, 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 my shape or my figure, put a little piece of Sandra over here into a title, you know, cause this is who I am now and, and this is all this. If I'm so busy scattering my spirit out, if I'm so busy like putting it into other things, I can't like, you know, bring it all together and make myself whole and, and lift myself up cause I'm so busy putting it out somewhere else. There is this thing, you know, this, I, I talk about this scattered energy because I think it's so important that we start to consolidate our spirit. You know, this, I talk about it in the sense of, of creating this energy vortex, this vortex that is so powerful. And when we concentrate this vortex, it's like a tornado and it just kind of brings all the forces of ourselves together. If you think about thoughts as things and them having power to create, only when we get that focus in, only when we bring and develop that energy, do we really have that creative power to do what it is that we need to do. So now, um, let me see. I'm sorry. Um, with all thy getting, get the understanding. Yes, sir. So, so it, it's like this, this whole energy thing. So when we start to consolidate this into ourselves and stop putting our, our energy into other things and, and, and broadcasting it out. When we start to understand the power that we have, then we stop selling ourselves short. But we get stuck in the little stuff. So, so like, um, you know, if we talk about a question of values and a question of integrity and all of those things, we get caught up, caught up. I mean, because, because to some extent we're, uh, Carolyn Miss. Ah, let's talk about Carolyn Miss for a minute. She, um, or, or I'm sorry, you know, I, I make it seem like it's all Carolyn Miss. I, I love reading her. Um, and she's got all these wonderful books out there about, um, why some people heal and others don't. And she's got a whole bunch of, 
a whole bunch of stuff. It's spelled M Y S S. And um, she's got a whole bunch of stuff out there that you can read on archetypes and and um, all all these different things. But really, it was Carl Jung um, and and his research and and uh, his his stuff that was really talking about archetypes. But Carolyn is um, is one of those people. She has really delved into it as if and to say to us that all of us have these archetypes at work and like astrology they are playing in our background so whatever you know so so you know it, it, it's all these things so she put together this whole system of us reading our own energy our own um how do i want to say it's like a life map she she talks about um and and so we have this ability to look at and see what roles we're playing out and what games we're playing anyway um she talked about she talks about these archetypes as if um we all play some part in these roles or these figures and so at one point she talks about all of us having this wounded child archetype or we'll have the um, abandoned child archetype. It's like a whole bunch of different things that we're playing out. But what was interesting was um, after talking about the idea of idolatry and idols, it was interesting because I wanted to flip over and look at what she had said about the not only the saboteur archetype, but the prostitute archetype. I'm talking about Carolyn Miss, and in particular, I'm um, dealing with her book today for just a minute. She wrote, wrote a wonderful book called Anatomy of the Spirit that broke down the chakra systems, the Kabbalah, and um, and uh, what else did she break down in that book? But um, And the archetypes, and she talked about each one of those and how it manifests in our lives. But then she wrote sacred contracts because she said that she wasn't dealing with doing healing anymore, but rather wanted us to see how to heal ourselves. And you guys, for the most type, um, um, okay, her new book, she's got an audio book out called um, Sacred Contracts. I love all of her stuff. And I've got, you know, I have her big book here. It's like a little Bible almost. Um, but, but it's, you know, she's got all this stuff in here. And it, you know, it's just fascinating when you start to break down the pieces of your life and how they play out for you. So when she was talking about the, the whole thing, it made me think about um, the, the idol worship and all those things. And she talked about this one in particular about, um, I, I could talk about the saboteur because that resonated with me. But for a second, I want to talk to you about the prostitute. Um, and I, you know, for, for those who are watching me on YouTube, you stream, excuse me, I had to bend over and pick up my glasses because I had dropped them on the floor. On here, um, so let me, let me share with you just a couple of things. Um, a prostitute archetype, prostitutes thrive most bountifully in subtle ways and in, or, and in ordinary everyday circumstances. It comes into play most clearly when our survival is threatened. Its core issue is how much we're willing to sell yourself for, how much you are willing to sell yourself for, your morals, your integrity, your intellect, your word, your body, or your soul for the sake of physical security. So when I had a woman tell me a few weeks ago that she felt like she was called to the ministry, but she wouldn't do that because it didn't pay the bills. I was like sitting there totally baffled, thinking like what a disempowering thought to say that you won't do what it is that you love because it won't pay the bills. I'm sitting up there saying, why can't you do it on the side? Why can't you do the small things you do? Because it is when you accept that, when you, when you, when you accept your gifts, when you do what it is that you love, uh, as Joseph Campbell said, unseen hands, unseen forces come out to support you in what you're doing. Um, so she goes on to say the um, prostitute archetype also drastically, dramatically embodies the test uh, 
and test the power of faith. If you have faith, no one can buy you. So it's this thing like sometimes we sell ourselves, you know, for, oh, 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 oh. So, so, and I want to tell you guys some stories on this, but let me read a little bit more and then I'll tell you some personal stories that I have. I fully, um, okay, so this one woman in here in her testimonial, she says, I fully admit that I don't have enough faith to put my integrity before my mortgage and my spiritual direction before my promotions in the physical world. So the, archi the prostitute archetype can act as a guardian that awakens you to situations in which you decide to take up your bed and walk. Once you get away from a circumstance that costs you too much money, energy, dignity, or time, lasting transformation is possible. Um, so she goes through and she talks about it um, in the sense that we stay in, whether we're staying in a relationship or staying on a job or whatever, we are constantly selling off little pieces of the self um, like bargaining chips. We're selling off parts of our soul in order to do certain things instead of like trusting that the universe is supporting our desires. You know, it's funny because when I first got on the spiritual path, I used to, you know, I was always like sitting up here thinking to myself, like, OK, I'm going to hell because I just I knew I was going to hell. Because there was so much in my life that I just didn't want to give up in the name of my spiritual development. There was so much that I just loved to do. And I kept thinking to myself that I was this one, this, this horrible sinner. And so, I, you know, I just, you know, I was like, okay, not now, God. You know, right, maybe when I get older, maybe when I do certain things, after I've done certain things, Maybe then I'll give my life over because that was what I was taught in traditional religions. I never heard until I got into A Course in Miracles that God wanted me to be happy. I think Miriam Williamson said it in her book, A Return to Love. And it was just such a, 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 I mean, like an amazing thought for me. I, it never dawned on me, never in my wildest dreams could God actually want my happiness. and. When I walked the spiritual walk, I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be happier than I had ever been before. The whole concept to me was just a foreign idea because, because it was always the thou shall nots and, and this, that, and the others. It was always what I had to do. I was never told that I was supposed to follow my bliss and follow what makes me happy. I was always told, you know, you're not supposed to do this. I even, you know, y'all, I, I told y'all um, a couple of weeks ago how I have a friend of mine, a good friend, that is Muslim, and I love doing prayer with them. And I even went to, um, I even went to the mosque the other day for a dinner because we're in the midst of Ramadan, bless their hearts. We're in the midst of Ramadan where they can't eat from sun up to sundown. And um, another thing that they think God is asking for their sacrifice and, you know, doing it in the name of those who are less fortunate and all that stuff. You know, whatever it is that you believe, it is done unto you as you believe, right? So God bless you for if that's, you know, if that's your thing. But it had never occurred to me that God truly wanted me to be happy. I mean, that was a foreign thought. And so when I started thinking to myself, like, wow, God really wants me to have, be happy? Really? Does God care that I'm happy? Really? I mean, I was going through this thing where I was like, mm, you know, like, so maybe I can take this spiritual walk if God truly wants me to be happy because I want to be happy. I want to be happy. And, and so, look, I didn't turn into some goody two-shoes. My happiness was not found in being a goody two-shoes. My happiness was found in doing what you know doing this whole thing of yeah, just telling you that yes you know representing representing god to you so not not oh i mean that's so powerful 
It is so powerful. So, so my thing is all about, you know, now it's, it's not so much about thou, thou shall not. That's not where God is in the thou shall not. God is in this every day. Like, how do you become better? How do you make yourself be better? How do you follow your bliss? What makes you happy? And once you found your happiness, that happiness adds to the very fabric of all the vibration that is going on right here in this universe. And that's a powerful thing. I love that. Okay, so um doctor, okay, he 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 hooking. <laughs> she said hooking, huh? You go looking for a booking for you to go hooking. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> okay, so um, so so here, let me let me just say this. Let me read this part to you too, because this falls up under the saboteur, but it it goes so in line with this whole thing. So it says that um that we can silence this. You know, we have this saboteur thing going on and a lot of us you know like fight off our own good throw away our own good try not to um chase after our own good because we know better you know we know better um we think we know better and so a lot of times we don't do what makes us happy um we stay in relationships why because we think what Okay, so so yeah, I think that in a relationship we have, you know, we grow, we grow spiritually, we grow all this stuff. Yeah, I think we're supposed to be in relationship. But if your relationship is making you miserable, are you staying there because you don't know that God is the source of your supply? Well, let me say to you here and now, God is the source of your supply. It's not your job. It's not your man. It's not any of those things that you thought it was. Not your reputation. Not your title. It's none of those things. God is the source of your supply. God is the source of your supply. Can I say that one more time? God is the source of your supply. God is the source of all of my supply. And even, you know what? And even when it seems like my supply is running low, Hallelujah, praise the Lord anyway. Because this prostitute, this prostitute um, archetype is telling us that a lot of times what we do is, is because we don't trust, because we don't trust, we're so willing to go for pennies. And, and now that we have um, crackheads out here on the street, everything is the $5 holla. You are worth more than that. You are worth so much more. And so the thing is, is to recognize your value. Okay, so yes, that is it, Sandra, not to realize that God is the source of my supply. I say it again, God is the source of my supply, all supply. So under the saboteur, um, it, it says following your intuition. Dove is going to play parts of this, um, uh, this uh, sacred contract. And for some reason, I think I listened to um, an audio recording of Sacred Contracts, and I think it's a, a little different than the book, but I don't even recall right now um, how it's different. But I think it was uh, a workshop or something that she did and then recorded it. Um, but it's a little different from the book, if I re remember correctly. But um, it says in here that uh, the way that we get around giving in to and sabotaging our own desires, sabotaging our lives, sabotaging this, strengthening our our core, that by bringing all those things that together, our personal power, you know, it talks about we having, our having 12 powers. And so by bringing all these powers together in and centralizing and concentrating it as us, we, it, we strengthen and we empower ourselves. So, so in here it says that following your intuition, it serves you brilliantly as a gut instinct that directs you to take action based on hunches rather than on rational thought. Now, mm, get this, because a lot of times people try to use logic 
They try to run their life by what is logical. You hear that inner voice. You hear that inner calling. You feel that telling you to do something, but you think you're going to go with logic rather than that inner knowing, however it is that spirit communicates to you. Now, let me let me tell you, because I, I took some classes on this. Um, there are different ways that spirit communicates with us. Sometimes we see pictures in our mind, you know, like I'll see horses running or I'll see water or symbols is what I'll see. Can somebody get that? <laughs> but but symbols is what I'll see. And I have to interpret the meaning of symbols. So when I see myself in my dream and I'm walking around barefoot and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about being barefoot, barefoot feet are the, the symbol for understanding. Feet are sacred, and if you look in the Bible, it, it, it presents feet in a, safe, in a sacred way. He told Moses to take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. In, 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 feet have sacred. So, so, so understanding symbols is part of this, of, of understanding intuition and how it works. Understand your symbols. So if you get pictures, understand the symbols. You may hear words. You may hear somebody talking in your ear. Or it may be an internal voice that you hear in your head. You may get this knowing that just comes over you. I get that sometimes. I just know what I know. And there's no explanation why I know it. I just know. Um, uh, another way. Okay, so I, I, I um, sometimes we see like ticker tape words going across our head. I mean, there's so many ways that people get messages about what to do, where to go, how to respond. If you start to look at the ways in which spirit talks to you and, and go with that and follow that, it, I mean, it empowers you like nothing else. So let me finish reading this thing here before I go off on another tangent. Okay, so. It serves you brilliantly as a as a gut instinct that directs you to take actions based on hunches rather than rational thought. To learn to experience that voice, you must respond to it. You must respond to it. And as you respond to it, you get greater and greater, you know, instructions and responsibilities and things that are coming to you that you should do. So by responding to it, you learn to trust it. Only through response can you manifest the courage to expand your creative environment. So, um, and, and, and spirit doesn't tell you anything fantastical to do. It doesn't tell you, um, you know, go to Namibia. If you can't get to Namibia, sometimes it'll tell you, you know, go to your internet and type in something or, or go to something, something that you can do. It did tell Jonah, though, to go to Namibia and, and, and deliver a message, and he was to go some other way. And then it says a whale came along and swallowed him up. And this whale, he was in the belly of the whale for three days. Three is a significant number. It is the number of expression. So he was in this belly of the whale. And what does the belly of the whale mean? It signifies water signifies the subconscious. It went under the water. And then when it sped him out on the other side, spit him out exactly where he was supposed to be. That's how spirit works. It's so wonderful. So wonderful when you start to get into it. So, um, <laughs> so it says start with small choices, which may be life transforming acts. Um, that will disguise, will be disguised as little harmless impulses. So once you learn how to hear that voice, once you learn how to respond to it, it will take you places that you didn't even imagine. You guys, um, and, and I know I'm running short on time and I don't even know, uh, whatever. I'm running short on time. I want to tell you though, if you're here in Cleveland, if you're in Cleveland, Ohio, I'll be speaking on August 12th. And you'll see me posting on it um, all over the place. But August 12th, I will be at um, Agape Renaissance speaking on that Sunday morning. So I hope you'll come out and listen to me. I'll be talking about the mythical journey. That's the topic. They wanted a topic already. And, you know, I don't I don't do topics very well because I like to listen to what spirit tells me in the instant. But the instant they asked me what I wanted to talk about, I knew right off the bat that I wanted to talk about the mythical journey, your mythical life. Um, and so I, I will be there sharing some stuff with you. Um, but but now here, before I, I let go of this um, prostitute archetype, let me tell you about, uh, I said I was going to tell you a personal story about this, and I've got a few. 
Um, so I, I used to work at a nonprofit agency, and this nonprofit agency was, you know, a small nonprofit. We did, um, I did computer training. I was in charge of uh, the computer lab there. And we were constantly trying to get in not only companies, bigger, major companies to donate to us computers, but we were also in the midst of shopping programs and figuring out how we could get um, other monies from the government to keep this program going. And I was working directly up under this one guy and uh, who was really cool. He was, you know, you know, we, we worked well together. But it was interesting because um, it was it was like every time he was trying to get some money, what he did was is he sent me out, depending on who it was, he sent me out like I was the personal representative um, of, of the agency. And it was usually some, you know, he would take me along on these business dinners or these functions. And, you know, I remember asking him at some point, you know, after this happened about a few times, I was like, you know, what are you, are, are, are you trying to pimp me? <laughs> and, and, and the reason why I thought about this story was because it is a story that happened in sacred contracts where a woman who was a secretary was being asked to entertain all these business clients and um and and she said that at some point the people that she was working with that somebody else in the secretarial pool asked her if she was being asked to do other favors and um and she was totally offended and taken back but then she really looked at at what was going on and how she was participating in this most of the time when we think about archetypes and having this energy of the prostitute, we think of it in terms of it being about selling our bodies. But uh, another friend of mine, dear friend of mine, was working for a pharmaceutical company, and he was pushing a, a, a particular drug that was shown to be harmful and ineffective and causing problems. And when he said something, he was first given a warning about it, like he needed to keep his mouth shut. And then he was reprimanded and eventually fired because he decided that he could no longer, in good conscience, um, push a product that he knew to be harmful to other people. A lot of times that is our, our prostitute archetype that says that it is more important to have a job than to have integrity. Personal integrity, honesty, all of those other things. It, you know, so, so it becomes this thing about deciding who you are. It's about getting your, your feet. I, I love this idea of, of being able to stand up tall in the world. And what that means for you, I know it's a bodily image, but we use bodily images all the time to explain stuff. But a lot of times we feel like we're fragmented and scattered and we don't quite know why. And it's about this idea of, of being able to bring into alignment all of these parts of ourselves. So it's, you know, our head and our heart needs to be in agreement. Our mind, our thinking, and what we truly feel in our heart needs to agree. And so a lot of times, no matter what you're doing, you can get caught up in prostituting yourself, selling off your own personal integrity, your own desires, or something else, thinking that those things are more important than your own happiness and following your bliss. And I'll tell you, I have had to let things go. I've had to let people go. Um, in order to, to own this. And, and so say, for instance, if my thing, if I want to do, if I'm about, um, really dedicating myself to being among the teachers of God, what does that mean for me? It doesn't mean to me that I've got to be Mr. Goody Two Shoes, but it does mean, and, and whatever that means, I don't even know what Miss Goody Two Shoes means. I just use that terminology, um, because because that's most, what most people have this image of, this impression of. 
but it means being able to own who I am and to work through my issues. So whatever my issues are, it's about owning those and working through them to make myself better. If I know that I'm constantly being caught up in compromising situations, then I need to choose, choose Sandra, choose Sandra's desires, choose Sandra's goals and be operate in alignment with those because people will make you or have you abort what it is that you want for your life. They will have you aborting that process. And so if what you really want is something better, something greater for yourself. Then, then, then that means that you need to figure out how to stand up taller in the world, how to have things like honor, integrity, how to make good choices for yourself, how to choose your bliss, how to follow that, how to, how to, how to do those things. What does it mean to have courage? I mean, is courage just, you know, cause you've got a gun? I mean, come on, that's not courage, that's cowardice. What does it mean to be defenseless? I mean, what does that mean to you? I mean, so maybe it's, so this course, talking about it being a required course, brings up all those issues. So it says to us that we're going to learn, and whether you learn through pleasure or pain is up to you, but you're going to learn. So if you're going to learn, it's about taking these lessons and seeing what the lessons are for you. Where does your happiness come from? My happiness is my fun and my function are one. I mean, I, so, so not seeing yourself as split and splintered. If, if it's telling you about, um, about faith, what does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to be a minister of God? What does it mean? All of this stuff is like discovering what all these things mean for you and your life. What does it mean to trust? You know, where does your strength come from? Where does your vision come from? Where does your sight come from? What is the source of your supply? All of those questions come up for you and you have to figure out for yourself who you are. I love this because, you know, I don't know any place else that it is like this course in life that you get to walk, you get to understand, travel and make decisions for yourself on. And this course is just so excellent because it, it takes me through all of that. So even when I'm, you know, even when I'm tempted to think that I've done all that I needed to do, um, the, the places in me where I haven't forgiven things comes up, you know, and it challenges me to say, oh, are you really forgiven? So forgiving. So um, this past week I ran into, and as a matter of fact, I talked about her on here. That's so tripped out. So I, I ran into this girlfriend that was mad at me um, and had been mad at me for a while. And I, I told you guys about it. I don't know if it was last week or week before, but I was talking about her and I, and I told you she had this thing about, um, uh, and whatever with her boyfriend and, and her having this like, um, competing with me and being jealous and all this other stuff. I told you guys about that if you were here um, before, but I talked about it. I ran into her. It was so funny. Um, and I saw her come in and I was standing in this, um, this place and, you know, all these folks are around and I saw her when she came in the door and it was so amazing because as I was watching her, I, because I've been friends with her um, and had been friends with her for 20 years, I knew that she was purposely not looking my way because this is a person that is, you know, just like me, she's kind of, you know, like always gregarious, always talking, always smiling. And she was purposely not looking my way. And so I, you know, of course I got up, you know, and went over to her table and I said, hi. And because, you know, because when I tell people that just because I don't want to hang out with you or just because I've chosen differently doesn't mean that I'm mad at you. I need to act on that as well. I need to, if I know that I am love, always be in a loving space, always be in an accepting space and always extend myself that way. Because that's just how I am. That's who I am. 
And so um, that was, I think, a healing moment. I don't know. Um, yeah, it was a healing moment for both of us. You know, I, I, I wasn't holding anything against her. She was mad at me, whatever. So um, I'm glad we got that straightened out. I rest in God. I am in God. It is in God that I live, move, and have my being. We are all sourced in God. And when you accept that truth, you'll accept how wonderful you are. You can't help but be. Now, if I think you're wonderful and special, who are you not to, right? Okay, so agree with me. Love you. And um, I will see you soon. I see that Barrett Hadim has just walked into the room. Woohoo! And uh, it's time for me to go. But you guys, I love doing this. And so um, SandraSaidIt.com is my website. Follow me on Twitter at uh, San, S-A-N-B-I-S-H-O-P. Sam Bishop, follow me there on Twitter. And uh, you can friend me on Facebook, Sandra D. Bishop, or you can like my fan page, Sandra Thrives on Facebook. I love you guys. And uh, thank you so much, Dove. And thank you so much, everybody. Uh, just just kisses and smooches to you. And doctor, thank you, baby. All right. I love y'all. See ya. All right. I'm turning over the mic. Here we go. There we go. All right. And so for those of you, whoever was listen, looking at me on Ustream, thank you for being there. Love you. And see you soon. See you next time. All right. Stop recording.